Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I want to go over pharmacology. I'm going to go over a retired uh, pharmacology quiz. It's a very basic, like literally first day of class of pharmacology quiz. So these are basics that um, you should know. So it's going to be a very quick video. As always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video, subscribing to my channel if you have done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Okay, guys, so get, let's get started. First question, drug evaluations are tightly controlled by FDA, DEA, CIA, or FBI. I wrote these questions. So the actual evaluations, the testing, who's responsible for that? The um, Food and Drug Administration. Correct answer is A. Number two. Which pregnancy category includes studies in animals or humans that demonstrate fetal abnormalities or adverse reactions reports indicate evidence of fetal risk, which means it is completely contraindicated to give if the woman's pregnant, right? If it's a medication and the woman's of childbearing age, you better, you know, test that HCG and make sure she's not pregnant. By the way, the reason that we're checking HCG, guys, HCG is a hormone um, that is created by, um, uh, my goodness, I'm having a brain fart. Give me a second, guys. The placenta and the chorionic villi. Okay, so that's why we're checking HCG. HCG is that pregnancy hormone. But anyway, I digress. Uh, which would be the pregnancy category for something that's teratogenic, which means it's harmful to the fetus? And the correct answer is E, category X. Number three, the scheduling of controlled substances is regulated by which governmental agency, FDA, DEA, CIA, or FBI? And the correct answer is B, Drug Enforcement Agency. For the amount of drug that's found in the drug label, is it drug dosage, drug quantity, drug amount, or drug strength? And is drug quantity, how much is actually in the bottle, right? The drug dosage, that is how strong each, whether it's a tablet or a capsule or tab, uh, whatever it is, it's the, the dosage is the strength. Number five, drug excretion primarily occurs through the kidneys, right? What's the function of the kidneys? The function of the kidneys is to clean out the blood. It takes all of the toxins and everything that's not needed from the blood, forms urine, and it's excreted through the urine. Now, some of the medication can be excreted through uh, feces and other ways, but primarily it's the kidneys. And that's why we're so careful if a patient's kidneys um, are not working properly, we're very careful with medications because that means they're not going to be excreting that medication properly, which means they're going to be at higher risk for a toxic level of that medication. Number six, which factors affect drug absorption when given intravenously? Select all that apply. Now, guys, you know how we treat select all that apply is what? True or false. So we're giving that medication IV what factors would affect its absorption? And this is a trick question because guess what? The correct answer is E, none. Not cold, not heat, not decreased blood flow, not acidity of the stomach. Why? It's already being given IV. It's already going into the vessel. Absorption, what absorption? Right? What absorption? Now, let's say we were giving something um, IM. Yes, heat would make a difference because heat causes vasodilation. So it would cause the medication to be absorbed faster or cold causes vasoconstriction. It would cause um, the drug to be uh, absorbed slower or let's say the medication is going through the GI tract. Obviously, if there's some type of bowel obstruction. The absorption could be slower or if um, uh, blood flow to the GI tract, absorption could be slower. But if it's going intravenously directly into the vessel, where's the absorption? None, absolutely none. So the correct answer is E, none. Number seven, which drugs are absorbed from the small intestine and undergo many changes? A, oral, B, parental, C, subcutaneous, or D, intramuscular? And this 
I'm not going to say it was tricky, but if you kind of paid attention, you should have gotten the correct answer. It's going to be oral. Let's say you didn't even know what the correct answer was. But parental includes subcutaneous and intramuscular, right? And this is a multiple choice, which means you can only um, choose one answer. So just with that alone, as a student, you should have said to yourself, Okay, I don't know what the answer is, but it has to either be A or B because C and D are both parts of B. And that's how you need to be thinking when you're looking at these test questions, if it's multiple choice. Because you see choice uh, B, parental, that is an umbrella answer for choice C and D. Whenever you get a multiple choice question and you have no idea what the answer is, but you see an umbrella, you see an umbrella answer, you better choose between that umbrella answer and another choice that you think is the an answer. And if there is no other choice, choose umbrella. You might be wrong, but you really increase your chances. In this situation is wrong. The correct answer is oral, but just um, as a rule of thumb, if you have no idea what the answer is and you see an umbrella um, answer choice, you're better off if you go with that. But let's talk about this one. Oral, just think about it. You take a med medication by mouth, it has to go through what? The GI system. It has to be metabolized by what? The liver. So oral is the correct answer choice. Uh, number eight, which is not a clinical manifestation found in a patient with stomatitis. A, swollen gums. B, abdominal cramps. C, difficulty swallowing. D, glossitis. And the correct answer choice is B, abdominal cramps. That has nothing to do with stomatitis. When you see stomatitis, what is that? That's inflammation of the oral mucosa, right? So that has to do with the mouth. That has nothing to do with the stomach. It sounds like stomach, but it's stomatitis, right? So the swollen gums, the difficulty swallowing, glossitis, all of that has to do with that. But abdominal cramps, the tummy ache, absolutely nothing. So choice B is the correct answer choice. Number nine, which is not a nursing intervention for the patient diagnosed with hypokalemia, A, preventing injury, B, monitoring cardiac activity, C, replacing serum potassium, or D, administering k exalate as ordered? And the correct answer is D, administering k exalate as ordered. Think about it. Your normal potassium is 3.5 to 5. This patient's potassium is less than 3.5 because they're hypokalemic. Why would we give them K-exalate? Remember K-exalate, what does it do? It binds the potassium. So when the patient has a bowel movement, it comes out in the fecal matter. That patient that has hypokalemia, why would we want them to get rid of even more potassium? Absolutely not right? So we would want to do a prevent injury. We would want to put that patient on cardiac monitor because whenever you're thinking of potassium, you better be thinking of the heart. And we do want to replace the potassium that they're missing, but we're not trying to get rid of it. We're not going to give them K-exalate. K-exalate is for the patient that has hyperkalemia. Number 10, what drug class can cause severe auditory nerve damage? Anticholinergics, macrolide antibiotics, antipsychotics, or loop diuretics? What do you guys think? And the correct answer is macrolide antibiotics. The macrolide antibiotics are very, 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 very hard on the hearing, eighth cranial nerve, okay? It can cause the patient to have permanent hearing loss, okay? It's very hard on the eighth cranial nerve. It's very hard on uh, the kidney. So you better be looking at the, um, the kidney function test. You better be looking at the urine output, the GFR, the BUN, the, cre cre um, the urine creatinine. Uh, before that patient's placed on a macrolide antibiotic, you better do a hearing test, right? Because one of the contraindications to giving that type of medication is the patient already having problems with hearing. You're going to cause them to go deaf. So before you administer that medication, you better look at the chart and make sure that a hearing test was done because that absolutely is a contraindication. By the way, anticholinergics, that's choice A, you know, it kind of dries you up. It not kind of, that's what it does. It dries you up. Uh, remember, anticholinergics can't see, can't spit, can't pee, can't, right? Can't see. Uh, blurred vision, can't spit. Uh, Zeros, I'm, I'm pronouncing, I always pronounce that wrong. Xerostomia, that's a dry mouth. Can't see, can't spit. Can't pee, uh, urinary retention, and can't constipation. 
Those are the big uh, uh, signs, uh, clinical manifestations that we see with this medication. And it's usually given like before surgery, you want to dry up their secretion so they don't aspirate during surgery. Uh, choice C, antipsychotics. These are given for patients who have disorders, you know, such as schizophrenia where they're having auditory or visual hallucinations, uh, loop diuretics. These are diuretics that tend to make the patient lose L. L, L loop diuretics makes you L, L, lose potassium. So before you give a loop diuretic, you better look at that patient's potassium level, right? Think about it. If their potassium level is 3.5, are you going to go ahead and give that loop diuretic? Absolutely not. We just talked about the danger of hypokalemia, and we're not trying to throw that patient into hypokalemia. So make sure you look at uh, the, the potassium level of the patient before you give a loop diuretic such as Lasix. Number 11, Mr. Brady, a 32-year... 32-year-old female. I couldn't make up my mind. I met Miss Brady. Miss Brady, a 32-year-old female re uh, patient reports symptoms of hunger, headache, increased heart rate, confusion, lack of coordination. The nurse would further assess for symptoms of hyperglycemia, hypoglycemia, hyperkalemia, or hypokalemia. I can't speak. Hypokalemia. What do you guys think? And those are symptoms of what? Hypo. Uh, glycemia. Have you ever heard of someone who's hangry, right? Being hungry, angry, headache, increased heart rate, confused, lack of coordination, their blood sugar is low. Normal blood sugar is uh, um, 70 to 110, fasting. Okay. Number 12, excessive responsiveness to either primary or the secondary effects of a drug is known as hypersensitivity, drug allergy, anaphylactic reaction, or dermatologic reactions. Dermatological reactions. It's hypersensitivity. So that patient has a heightened or an increased sensitivity to that particular drug. Um, you guys know what a drug allergy is. An anaphylactic reaction is um, a lethal or deadly allergic reaction. Okay, it's much worse than reg just a regular allergic reaction. When a patient has an anaphylactic reaction, you better have some epinephrine available on hand. And, you know, dermatological reactions are a type of um, uh, reaction of the skin. An example of that, a horrible um, dermatologic reaction would be something like Stephen Johnson syndrome. Next question, number 13, what are common side effects of anticholinergic, select all that apply? How do we treat select all that apply as true or false? Blurred vision, true. Urinary retention, true. Constipation, true. Photophobia, that sensitivity to light, absolutely true. So A, B, C, and D, true. Oh, and E, A, B, I feel like I missed one. Blurred vision, or I don't think I mentioned dry mouth. Absolutely. Blurred vision, dry mouth, urinary retention, constipation, photophobia. All of those are uh, side effects of anticholinergics. All right, last question. What is a universal color for insulin? Red, orange, blue, or white? Orange. And that's why all of the insulin needles, you'll always see that they have an orange top. And when you're measuring the insulin, it's always going to be in units. Okay. If you're looking at the syringe and it says ML, you got the wrong syringe. Okay. It's always going to be in units with an orange top. So for number 14, B is the correct answer. This was a very short video, very basic, but it just gives you an idea of just the basic things, even starting out that you should know in regards to pharmacology, this was an exam that I've retired, so I decided to cover it with you. Uh, let me know what you guys thought about this video. I know I need to continue my series on the sexual transmitted infections. I think next will be um, HIV and AIDS, and so most likely I'll be making that video tomorrow, but I just wanted to change the pace just a little bit, but I promise that video is coming. Again, please let me know what you thought about this video, what you'd like to see me cover or cover more of, and don't forget, almost daily, you guys can find, find me on my other social media platforms covering a variety of nursing topics, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Check me out. Don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. Thank you so much for watching this video, and you guys will catch me on the next video.